Okay, perfect. Well, in that case, I think we can probably go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here at the Digital Matters Fall 2020 Research Talks. I'm Rebecca Cummings and I'm the Digital Matters Librarian. Today, we're gonna to hear from the five Digital Matters graduate students and faculty fellows on some of the work that they've done this semester. The way it's gonna work if you haven't been here in the past is that we'll have each presenter give a 10 minute talk and then we're going to do a combined Q&A at the end for all five projects. So I do have one announcement before we get going. For anyone who doesn't know this, our Digital Matters Director David Rowe will be on parental leave this spring. So if you have any questions at all about Digital Matters or our spring programming, please feel free to reach out to me or to Greg Hatch who will be serving as Interim Digital Matters Director this spring. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce each presenter in the order that they're going to present, um, probably. So first up, we're going to have John Flynn, who's our Digital Matters and American West Center graduate student fellow, and he's a PhD student in history. And John will be presenting on the Native Scholars Clearinghouse. Next, we'll have Max Schleicher, who's our Digital Matters graduate fellow and a PhD student in the Department of English. Um, and he'll be speaking today on a computational analysis of poetry blurbs. Third, we'll have Malad Mozari, who's our Digital Matters Exhibition and Performance Faculty grantee. And he's also the Assistant Professor in the School of Architecture. Malad will be speaking on resonance map, remote sensing and possible translations. Fourth, uh, the fourth speaker will be Marnie Powers Torrey, who's a Digital Matters Faculty grantee and an Associate Librarian in the Marriott Library. And Marnie will be speaking today on interactive website to extend and sustain access to artist books. Uh, last but not least, we'll be hearing from Todd Samuelson, who's our Digital Matters faculty grantee and an associate librarian at the Marriott Library. Todd will be talking about negative space, visualizing historical illustration processes. Now, as our speakers present, please feel free to add your questions to the chat box and we'll direct those to the presenters during the Q&A session at the end. Um, I do want to ask the presenters to be mindful of time and to stay within your 10 minutes to make sure that we can get through all five presentations and have time for Q&A at the end. So John is our first speaker, but let me see if he's joined us yet. John, good to see you. Yep. Let me make you a co-host. And then you should be able to share your screen from there. Okay. Should be able to see my screen, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thanks for the introduction. Rebecca should be loading. So um, as Rebecca said, I'm presenting on the Native Scholars Clearinghouse. This is a project that's being done in conjunction between Digital Matters and the American West Center. So um, a little bit of background on this, just because it's even though it's the last day of November, um, it's kind of topical that um, November is the National Native American Heritage Month and uh, the day after Thanksgiving or Black Friday that we usually know it as is the actual day. So um, if you're interested in after this talk, I'd encourage you to look at some of the resources they have. Uh, there's a website for this. It's a government website. So as a lot of government websites are, it's not the best, but it does point you in the direction of a lot of resources you can learn about. Um, on the last day of November. But on that note, um, it's related to this project because the focus of this is um, combining the resources at the university with um, the needs of Native American groups in Utah. So uh, the Native Scholars Clearinghouse is essentially a um, digital directory of anybody whose work at the university relates to projects that could um, aid or help Native American groups. So the origins of this, it's a project directed by Dr. Smoke at the American West Center. Um, and I saw Jeff was here. He started the project and I'm continuing it. So it's been in the works for a while now, but it emerged from this realization that there are a lot of people at the university who are in very different parts of the campus working on um, projects that relate to Native American groups. And this could be anything from in the medical um, center or humanities or architecture, but there is no clear and concise way to um, search for all these people in one spot. There's no way to connect them 
um, you would have to go through all these different channels, looking at different profiles across the university to find them. So our goal was to bring them all together to make it really easy for them to connect with each other, but also connect their work to the community at large. Um, so the first step in doing this would be actually connecting with the scholars across the university. We essentially just send out emails to invite them to join in on the project um, and send over the necessary materials that we would need to create a bio sketch. So anything like a photo, a bio, and links to the relevant work there. This was really important because since they know their project really well, we wanted them to put it in their own words and they would send that material over to us. We would store it in a box drive and then we put that onto our clearinghouse website. So essentially taking their words and putting it all in one location. A really important component of this is, as a lot of way things go in life, word of mouth is the best way to pass information along. It's really hard to try to track down all these different um, projects going on at the university. So we always ask them to recommend anybody who they think would be beneficial to be included on the site. Um, so we can constantly keep this website updated. And that's a really important part of this is that it's not a static website. Um, as these projects change and as new people come to the university and new projects develop, we want this to be constantly updated so people can keep coming back for this relevant information. Um, so I'll show you the website at the end of this PowerPoint, but here is a screenshot of what it looks like. Essentially, as I said, it's just a directory. Um, and you should be able to go and click on any of these profiles that you see and it will have all the information um, of the project that these work, these uh, scholars are working on. A really important component is we wanted it to look simple. So the site was really easy to navigate. Um, there's only these eight profiles right now, but as more profiles uh, are added, we want it to be really easy to find what you're looking for. So. Uh, the next step in this is adding a search function to filter by these different categories, because as I've said, there's a really big um, range of disciplines going on here, medicine, humanities, architecture, and law. So the next step beyond building the site is connecting these scholars with the community. Um, we want it to go beyond the university campus. Well, that is a really important component that scholars can look at each other's projects and perhaps collaborate. We want these to reach to the communities that their work actually touches on. So that Native American groups in Utah can come look at these profiles and see how they can be, um, how they can engage and interact. So the next steps to engage with this larger community is launching the site. It's in its test phase right now and advertising it across the campus and beyond. And then creating this search feature as I was discussing um, so as there are more profiles added, it will look something like this where you can come and navigate. And if you look over here on the right of the screen, you'd be able to filter by these different categories of law, health and medicine, because if there are dozens or more of these profiles, and if you're looking for something specific, you can go to these categories and see perhaps, you know, someone's looking for help with legal advice. There's a lot of law, um, or if they're looking for something that's engaged with medicine and health, they will be able to easily navigate and find um, people in those categories. So I think I need to stop sharing and reshare so I can show you the actual website. Are you able to see the website still? Okay, great. So this is the landing page for it um, with a brief description of it. And then just to show you the user interface, like I said, it's very simple and that's intentional. Um, you'll scroll down. And again, there's only these eight profiles right now, but you'll be able to click and see these bios pop up. And again, they're written in their own words because they really know themselves and their projects best. So you'll have a bio at the top, um, relevant projects, and then really importantly are these links to outside resources. So it's a point of exploration. Um, I think Dr. Warner has a couple of links in his as well. Um, so you'll be able to come in and look at all these projects and then be directed to the actual sites that um, contain these works. 
And again, this will be constantly updated as there's new developments in the projects and new scholars are added into that. Um, so I can put my email over here in the uh, chat if you have any questions or if you do know anybody who you think could contribute to the site, we'd really love to hear that from you. Um, and yes, it's still a test site right now. The university has to launch it. So they're the ones that remove that test from the URL. Um, and thanks for listening to that. I um, look forward to any questions you have at the end. Appreciate the time. Okay. Thank you so much, John. Um, and well within time. So I appreciate that. So our next speaker is Max. Max, I'm going to go ahead and make you the co-host now. Awesome. All right, let me get the screen share set up here. And oops. Awesome. So uh, as Rebecca mentioned, I'm one of the grad fellows uh, this fall and my project was twofold to build a database of poetry blurbs from the last 25 years and then to do some analysis on those blurbs. So to begin with, let's take a look at what the back of a book looks like. There are a couple different parts of the back of a book. We've got the uh, publisher's description, the promotional quotes, and then frequently a bio as well. So in doing a project about the blurb, the first question is like, well, what is a blurb actually? There's a little bit of disagreement in scholarship, believe it or not, about whether or not the description or the, these quotes are blurbs. So I'm doing both of them. Um, but as you can see here, there's about four or five different blurbs on one book. So the, the vast majority of my database is these actual quotes. It's just more of them per book. So um, let's take a look at some blurbs. You don't, don't actually have to read these, but just pay attention to a couple things I'm, I'm underlining here. So you'll notice that one of the things that blurbs do is that they give you these words like confession, narrative, working class poetry, forms and styles. They gesture to you to be to tell you what the uh, the poetic modes the book is working in. It's telling you it's a narrative book, a lyric book, a poetry of witness book, these kinds of things. Second thing we can notice from looking at a blurb is that it also frequently frames the uh, affect of the book. It's heart, vitality, passion feeling, these kinds of things are sort of foregrounded in the blurb, the emotional interaction that you have as a reader or the emotional framing of the poems themselves. And the last thing we'll uh, notice from looking at these guys is that often in blurbs, they will um, make reference to a canonical author, in this case, like James Wright or Walt Whitman, and say that this poetry book is in conversation with one of those canonical authors. And then the last thing, big picture, just to point out is that we take a step back and, and think, oh, holy cow, we've actually like underlined about six different things in each of these blurbs. That's, that in, of, in and of itself is pretty interesting because it means that the small chunk of text is actually jam packed with all kinds of data that we can try to extract. And so that's what my project is going to do. So the last kind of introductory point about the blurb is that they're really valuable to us because they're actually tied to specific times and places. So we can build a database of blurbs that came out in 1995 to 2020. And then through, because they're tied to a specific time, track how they've changed over time, <clears throat> like I've done here. So this is a graph showing um, the frequency with which blurbs mention, the, mention grief in them. And it's really interesting because you can see starting around 2015, there's a big uptick in, in framing poetry around grief. And I'll lead you to your own conclusions as to why like 2020 is the uh, top of the charts here we'll keep moving on. <clears throat> all right, so gathering data. How do I get all this data put together? So this is what a back of a book looks like. And this is what the back of a book looks like on Google Books. So often Google Books actually has like the preview of a book uh, as part of it, uh, the data that, for every book. Um, and if you notice, we looked at that publisher's description earlier, the top part of the back of the book, that actually gets uh, digitized almost always on the Google Books record. Sometimes they also include those uh, promotional quotes as well, but usually at least there's that, um, that description. So what that means is that because Google, has, Google Books is part of Google's open API, you can actually access that with a bunch of queries. Here I've got one that's searching for Ann Carson's glass essay. And then the, um, the API will actually send you back uh, a JSON, a nested data structure, 
that then you can use to build a data set. So what I did was I started from, I wanted to have like a, a list of books that were just sort of like the standard poetry books from the last 25 years. So I looked at everything that was a winner or a nominee for the major prizes from like the Pulitzer to the Yale Younger Prize, all these things. And I built a sort of seed list of poetry books. I fed those into the Google Books API and then had the Google Books API return like 400 other books that were similar. And from that, I would just build a massive list of potential books that then I would try to enrich with blurb data, which is my next step, uh, building out more or getting more data about ISBN numbers, publication dates, all these kind of things add to that data set. And once I started to go through that, I saw there wasn't, wasn't super uh, like helpful with in terms of like the descriptions were there, but not enough of those quotes. So then I did a lot of manual work doing a combination of uh, OCR, optical character recognition, taking scanned copies of the backs of the books, turning those into digital text files, and then including those blurbs into my data set. Also looking up uh, books on Amazon where their review section in the middle um, has oftentimes has the actual poetry blurbs in them and then manually looking books on Google Books to see if I could suss something out. So that was a huge part of the project and not very exciting until we finally get to analysis. So that leads us with a data set that looks something like this, where I have uh, each line of my data set has, a, has the blurb, who wrote the blurb, uh, then the author of the book, the book that it's uh, blurbed for, as well as other things like ISBN, et cetera. So let's start looking at what we can actually do with all of this data. So before I met, I, we noticed that like one of the things that it was talking about, boys were talking about were the modes, narrative and lyric that we see in poetry. So for those unfamiliar, uh, it's kind of like a, a commonplace to say that there are two kinds of, of American poetry, narrative and lyric. And the contemporary poetry is like kind of between these two things that you're either narrative or lyric or somewhere in the middle. So we can actually start to sort of model that over time. So we look at mentions of narrative and lyric uh, in contemporary American poetry. And we see that like, they were, they were very close to each other starting in the 90s, but then uh, they diverge and now uh, lyric is about twice as likely to be mentioned uh, as narrative. So you can see a sort of divergence potentially in style and, and contemporary poetry. We can apply the same sort of th uh, thinking to other kinds of modes that we might identify in poetry. So things like elegy, identity, history, nature, and uh, to see what's changed over the last five or 10 years. So doing that, we see that uh, poems that evoke history, politics, identity, uh, and, and the personal have increased over the last five years, whereas poems that are books that evoke image, myth, and nature seem to be on the decline. Maybe myth, maybe nature is going up in the last year or so. Um, and lastly, like elegy is sort of flat. So we can, use it, we can use this to get kind of an interesting bird's eye view of some, some major sort of like genre trends in poetry. Uh, I mentioned the, the sort of way blurbs uh, are geared towards our affective experience of poetry, a fierce intensity of a book. So we can actually also model that. Uh, I'll take a look uh, at the 500 or so most common words, pick the ones that are like have a high emotional register and graph the frequency with which those appear. And as we can see here, starting in 2015, there's a, there's a big inflection point where more and more sort of emotional register words start to appear in poetry blurbs. That's really interesting. So let's follow up and try to see if we can get a better understanding of what's behind that. So we can split those words into positive and negative. And we see that like that the positive affect words are pretty like uh, flat over the last 10 years, whereas the negative words are like tick uh, ticking up over across the board pretty broadly um, starting around 2015. So we see that there's something in the last five years that's really like shifted the way poetry is focused to like be expressing some sort of uh, negative emotion in the way at least it's marketed or at least and framed in, in a blurb. So the last thing that we'll look at is, as I mentioned, this tendency to reference canonical authors like Whitman. So there are two things we can uh, do with that. First, just look at like what the distribution of those canonical authors are. So we see that actually in, in American poetry, Whitman, Dickinson, and Stevens, Wallace Stevens, are sort of like by far and away the most frequently compared authors. So when we think about the canon as people like Wordsworth and Shakespeare, that may be somewhat anachronistic and maybe kind of like a newer, more recent canon of American poetry. <clears throat> so then we can also ask, how is that trending over time? And in general, we see that the, the, the reference of canon canonical authors has been like in a steep decline over the last uh, 20 years. And they're about like a fourth or a third of time less likely to actually mention that. And again, this points towards, if we are familiar with the field, a tendency in literary studies to question or problematize the, even the practice of making reference to the canon. So that, that seems to be uh, having an effect. So uh, wrapping up, 
when we think about blurbs, we think about the sort of marketing collateral tossed onto a book, this uh, rather than thinking of those as sort of like ephemeral or, or meaningless things, they're actually kind of data rich uh, sources uh, for us as scholars potentially. And that's all I've got. Thanks very much. And I'm looking forward to uh, listening to everybody else and to talking in the Q and A. Okay, thanks Max, that was great. Um, next up we have Malad, who I believe I just made a co-host. Are you able to see the screen share? I, I see it and I'm gonna engage it. Uh, hi everybody, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and set this up right away. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes, okay, Dennis says yes. We will start here. My name is Bilal Mazari. Uh, I am from the College of Architecture and Planning uh, in the program of multidisciplinary design. Uh, first of all, thank you to Digital Matters for hosting this event and this venue and this conversation. Uh, in terms of the, the project, I'm gonna go quickly over the background, uh, then talk about the research that I've done and where I'm taking it uh, as soon as the semester ends as well. Uh, which will give me a little bit more solo nerd time. Uh, the project started in Taiwan where uh, I was working with these uh, environmental sensors like this here. Uh, and we'll look at the schematic of this in a minute where uh, I had installed them throughout uh, in this town of Mado in Taiwan. And this is the, the points overlaid with a interpolation of a heat map of the soil moisture throughout the city itself. So this, is, this becomes somewhat of an agricultural tool uh, within the confines of this uh, city. Uh, we were fortunate enough to, in Southern Taiwan uh, with the, the indigenous Shirayan tribe, also install these prototypes with uh, a solar function. So the power aspect of it also becomes a sensor of its own of monitoring the landscape. So these sensors have uh, uh, ties to the land in terms of the methods in which uh, botany and architecture are also really uh, unified in this hybrid way in Taiwan specifically. In terms of the sensors, uh, there's visualizations of soil moisture on the left, as well as uh, what we have is the Google spreadsheets, uh, which are the web hooks that you use where these Wi-Fi devices can give you the timestamp, the temperature, the soil moisture value, and all that you would need, depending on the variables that you declare. This is the actual device itself. So what we have here is the, the analog pins, which the sensor connects to in terms of the, the moisture values it needs, as well as the IC here in terms of the, the data packets you could send. So over Wi-Fi and cellular, this works really um, perfectly. However, when I came to Utah, I went to remote places in Utah with this, and there is no cellular or Wi-Fi available. So I had to restart uh, how it worked. Uh, Adafruit creates these LoRa uh, or long range radio sensors for environments where you can actually go ahead and uh, send the, the same analog variables that you need in the process of uh, to send the data packets over radio to a, uh, to a receiver that's uh, within the confines of a few hundred miles and then it can actually upload it to a server for you in the same process. This is the one that I'm currently working with and looking at air quality in terms of Salt Lake City. Uh, and in terms of air quality, uh, this is the Argon, it's Wi-Fi, but there's a cellular version of it as well. The IC is uh, here as well. And you have the same analog pins as well as digital pins in terms of the data that you can uh, create. And there's various shields that you can actually work with in terms of these uh, configurations and the variables themselves you have the control of. But zooming out, I realized that there's a notion of active and passive data that I'm working with. Active data is where I declare the variables with these sensors, but then there's all this passive data around us in terms of air quality, as well as other variables that we don't know that are being uh, calibrated by our uh, phones or being measured. So I've been really uh, conscientious of that. I've been like, how do you actually evaluate the two? And I think for me, it's uh, the more they interact for IoT devices, uh, the more of an actual uh, configured space that we have control over, uh, as well as the legislation that goes over to, in terms of the privacy 
uh, that we want to control. In terms of moving forward, I've been looking at agent-based modeling as well. So not necessarily data visualizations in the stagnant sense, but if we go here, we have uh, what are simulations of these because data is not necessarily uh, something that just stays there, but it's living and it's moving and looking at the simulations of that. My first uh, agent-based modeling that I've been going towards is uh, looking at sonification of this data. Uh, this is through Max MSP, and uh, this is the, this example. I had a student help uh, create for me, but you can connect any API that you would like to it, and uh, what would, uh, what ends up happening is that you get a sonification of the uh, the JSON files that you hook to, or if you like, you can create web hooks to the devices that you have, as well as uh, integrating other things. Uh, the project has expanded more, and this is where I'm really, really excited about in terms of where it is. I've been creating, uh, I, I started collaborating with an old friend who works and lives in uh, Doha, and we started talking about the data that we're uh, working with and trying to see what kind of correlations we can uh, make. Because one uh, issue with IoT a lot of times is it does one singular function. It creates one thing, uh, you get the data for that, but, and that stops there a lot of times. And we're looking at uh, creating correlations of climate, uh, of looking at climate various, uh, in, in various methods essentially, where uh, looking at the data in terms of, oh, here's a chat to everybody. Nice. Uh, looking at the environmental data, the air quality data in both cities, as well as other things. And the midpoint in the semester is where I really had my epiphany with the project, uh, which was not looking at air quality data only, but uh, other things. And this was at an honest point where I was actually at the hospital when my partner was getting surgery. I was sitting in the waiting room, the news is on and uh, pre-election, if that's, if that's that. Um, uh, if that's a thing. And uh, also COVID's happening in the hospital, my partner. And I remember looking at my phone, I'm, I'm checking the weather and being so underwhelmed by what weather data does for me. And what that has done in the correlations, I think, is creating APIs and webhooks with the sensors themselves of combining air quality data with data scripts from Twitter, uh, actual word uh, searches. So we're looking at Twitter, uh, at the moment, we're looking at the word breathe and how it's actually being tweeted in lifetime alongside air quality data that's out there. And this is being uh, conducted for a performance in February with the Experimental Sound Studio as part of their quarantine concerts. And uh, what we're doing is that it's gonna be a night where we're gonna invite other people in. And my constraint is that the data is there, but I cannot touch the instruments that I'm working with. The instruments that I'm working with and how to do that is uh, I associate Utah with the high desert. There's uh, obviously with the news, there's this nostalgia of like the future of the 70s. So what we're actually doing in the process uh, and what I'll show you an example of is the APIs being routed through MIDI, I hope nothing falls over, and fed into an analog synthesizer here. So what you hear is a lot, what you're gonna to about to hear is a live stream of the air quality as well as the, the, the webhook of the sensors and a Twitter stream that scrapes the actual word breathe simultaneously. Because I think it's uh, creating a social climate like that uh, with these sensors does a little bit more for me than uh, perhaps I think. And also lets me not touch the instrument with a dynamic thing. So, I'm gonna go ahead and change my audio. If I can just get a thumbs up when you do hear the audio configuration change, please. You know, I actually don't have the privileges of those things. So no worries, there's uh, speakers for a reason.
Is there, where is the microphone? Okay, there you go. That's my timer. But the reason I went this route for me was, uh, I think well, one aspect that I, I want to emphasize and at the end is in this brief, brief presentation is uh, the it's not about what data we have, but it's who the data interacts with and who the data comes from, especially in this active and passive realm. Uh, and I've been thinking about that in terms of, it's not about me just developing these sensors and looking at APIs and data scraping, but who out there also wants to contribute to the social climate? And if we're able to actually create convergences of where APIs combine the process, we get a lot more interesting sonifications as well as visualizations of what that data uh, enables us to do in the process, uh, as well as uh, create legis uh, legislation, hopefully, and governance into around the ethics of how we have data surrounding us. So. I'll stop there, uh, and uh, I'm sure Digital Matters will uh, help us in the spring to publicize the, the performance with the quarantine concerts at Experimental Sound Studio. Cheers. Thank you. We would be happy to do that. Um, Marnie, um, I did give you co-host privileges, so let me know if you have any problems. And Malad, I also like your background. I think it's really fun. Oh, and Marnie, you're still muted right now. I got an error message that um, the host had disabled participant screen sharing. So I don't know if I need to accept co-host. Ah, let's see, I'm trying again. So I just put make co-host. Okay, I got it. It worked. Okay. Okay, so um, just giving some background as others have done. Um, since about 2005, book art scholars, um, notably, notably Richard Minsky, Lynn S. Vyeth, Daniel Starr, R. Arvid Nelson, Johanna Drucker, and Jerome McGann um, have ad advocated for a quote, digital, digital platforms that will deepen and expand the scholarly study of print documents by exposing hitherto invisible levels of artifactual signification. Um, and that's a quote from Lynn Vyeth. Um, there's a number of, of web presence that have, have occurred towards this um, effort. Um, Johanna Drecker's Artist Books Online, for example, Craig Dworkin's Eclipse Archive. There's many more. Max Schleicher's um, work, I think, would, would qualify as well. Um, so from as far as the artist books realm goes, from about two, 2012 to 2016, a group of catalogers involved with ARLIS, which is the Art Library Society of North America, worked on the web interface artist books thesaurus, um, which supports cataloging of artist books. Um, but they found that their volunteer group really couldn't sustain um, this activity. So, um, in January 2020, I presented at the College Book Arts Association um, annual conference and um, coordinated this panel between Ruth Rogers from Wellesley, Beth Shoemaker um, from Emory, and then myself. Um, and that, for that, that effort further explored opportunities for a shared language between curators, catalogers, and makers. And, um, that led to this current project, um, which is a, a facet, I suppose, of the, the larger project, which it seeks to extend these efforts with a broader audience in mind. So these were our initial lines of inquiry. Um, and now with colleagues from the Marriott Library user experience and web development team, Graduate student Jonathan Sandberg and I are building a public facing website that seeks to educate the broader public and facil facilitate use of a common vocabulary by scholars, makers, 
and community users of artist books. So the website, the database, visual exemplars and index hope to aid in the discoverability of artist books from entry level to advanced level. And the site will provide information on artist books, directives for using the index to ascertain the appropriate vocabulary for further research and invite the public to submit commonly used terms that hopefully will enhance discoverability. Um, so back to that January um, presentation, I gave, uh, so this gathering is um, the, the people who um, are exploring artist books um, as a, a scholarly um, area of study uh, were the audience here. So I gave them this sheet and I showed them a range of examples and asked them to assign a broader term and a more specific term to each of the images. So what I was showing is essentially um, common forms uh, that were referred to with a variety of terminology. They were either historical, or relative, relatively contemporary terms um, derived from common use in geographically and culturally diverse settings. They also might be uncommon forms uh, with no existing language of description. And then we also have been looking at materials as well as technologies and practices, both historical and contemporary. So for example, um, what's the term for pasting a pepper packet in a um, office bound book? Okay, so our initial research process um, was a joint effort with um, the Rare Books cataloger, Ali McCormick. Um, Jonathan and I collected data and, and charted that data. And then the cataloger um, was to make updates to the MARC records in the library catalog. Um, so we, we searched terms that we were familiar with in the common, in the following databases of the Library of Congress genre and form, as well as exploring some about subject, which is more complicated. Um, the Getty Research Institute and RBMS, and then finally the um, Arliss ABT. So initially our data gathering looked like this. Um, we um, had approximately, I think 1100 um, books. These are all items in the collections at the, um, uh, at, within the rare books collection, sorry. So we were collecting data, both genre terms and subject heading terms, um, as well as creator terms. And we made um, suggestions of additions or deletions from the MARC records. We then gathered our own kind of data here that is focused on um, matching terms, but for what makers, um, which I'm identifying as a maker, would link with how they would link with cataloging terms. So um, this is our chart that we are using now, and it's kind of a document that um, it oversees the workflow between our group and the web development group. So there's currently, uh, this is a 50 page document currently, um, and we are going at it by a, a slightly different uh, methodology. So we have um, our definition here, the ABT definition on the right, and then related terms are listed here, as well as um, sources for further research. Um, we are developing a list of um, terms to possibly propose um, to the Arliss group um, who uh, Best Shoemaker is um, happy to get in touch with the Getty. Um, control vocabulary is a very touchy thing, um, but Beth is a cataloger and a very good cataloger and respected cataloger. So um, but hopefully some of these terms can make their way back into cataloging language is um, part of the goals. 
Um, at some point, we'd really like to look at um, content and subject as well. As I mentioned, um, the difficulties are that the Library of Congress requires at least 20% of a book to be about a, a specific subject. Um, and it's difficult for the cataloger to ac accurately interpret an artist's intention, especially because book artists um, can often be intentionally oblique, cryptic, or ambiguous. Um, and our kind of the, the idea is that the clearer and more accessible the information is, the more likely that it will make it into the catalog and the book into a new reader's hands. So I wanted to show you, um, let's see. This is actually not what I wanted to show you first. I wanted to show you the artist books um, website, which I seem to have closed. My apologies. So it's not super easily um, So it's not super easy to find unless you know where the link is. And the reason for that is it is intended for catalogers. So you can type a term in their search um, and up will come the term and um, the definition as well as an example and then related terms with a link. So our website is, is similar to that. Um, we have modeled it, um, with the similar indexing, um, we will have this a home screen, which is really partially developed at this point, um, as well as an about section um, that will talk about the people who've worked on the project. And really exciting is a suggest the term, um, which will um, kind of be like an also called. Um, so at, at my school or in my practice, I've called this X, Y, or Z. So we'd hope to link that data as well. Um, if we move to the artist books terms themselves, we can type in a term here. And um, click on it, we have the opening artist definitions, that's us. Um, and then the artist book thesaurus definition as well. And then there um, are synonyms. Um, so, these are true synonyms, what we consider um, words that are very descriptive and that work. Um, and then we also have, I'm going to show you one more example, if I have time, the accordion fold. Actually, I'll show you the accordion bindings is a little more interesting, goes a little more in depth. So the idea is that, again, we'll have the two definitions and then links below. So this is the broader term, um, which will take you to fold out books, which is still um, within our site. Shoot. And then um, clicking in the wrong places here, as well as concertina bindings, that's a related term. So that'll take you to another definition on our site as well. And then folded books is the term that um, the Getty uses for, or the closest that they have to an accordion binding. So that takes you directly to um, the link of that described vocabulary. So I think that that is it. I hopefully I did okay. okay. That was great, thank you. Um, so Todd, uh, Todd is up next and he'll be our last presenter for today. Todd, let me know if, if I successfully made you a co-host or if something went awry. I think it should work. All right, thank you to everyone. It's a pleasure to participate with, with all of these projects and thank you to everyone who's made this possible. Um, a quick description of my project. My, my aim in this uh, negative space project is to develop a framework for distinguishing historical book illustration processes by automating the identification of various techniques. And my, my primary focus this semester has been to create a logic model 
for this pursuit that maps characteristics of each process and their relationships to, to one another. I'll, I'll go into this in a bit. And to start to build a corpus of high resolution photographic details of these historical illustration techniques under magnification. Um, and my, my concept is that all of this will be in preparation for a, a later machine learning phase of the project. So what is the, what is the purpose of doing this work and what do I anticipate maybe some outcomes of the project? Um, in, in the kind of the wider view in the field of book history, um, growing attention is being paid to issues of the material object and practices of historical book production, um, looking at the equipment, looking at blocks or plates. And a component of this approach, which interests me, involves the close examination of these objects used to produce historical books as a means of reconstructing technical and cultural uh, practices related to labor in the, the printing house during various periods. And so while identifying illustration processes may seem like a pretty fringe, um, highly specialized activity, and it is one that I think um, in the field is recognized as, as pretty challenging that takes a, a great deal of specialized study to become competent at. Um, it can also be very useful in determining the location, the period, and other circumstances uh, surrounding the production of a book, and also in, in using that contextual information to, to come to understand um, the distribution of the, the uses of a book by various uh, readerships. And uh, so a, a tool which is able to automate this process and um, utilize um, machine learning uh, in order to um, provide this information could be very useful. And personally, I feel that um, in providing libraries with the ability to augment catalog records with process specific information, it could be very helpful. And, and as such is sort of a, a parallel project to, to Marnie's. So very briefly, just a, a word about why I've structured the project as I, as I have. Um, this methodology is parallel to a, a digital humanities project that I, I worked on uh, from 2012 to 2015. Um, this is part, it was a Mellon project, um, Mellon funded project at Texas A&M's Initiative for Digital Humanities, Media and Culture. And the, the idea of this project was to create an open source OCR engine that was capable of improving the readability for um, the 45 million pages in a couple of proprietary databases, Ebo and Echo. Uh, and the way that this is relevant to my current project is that it involved researching historical objects and documents as a step toward training the OCR engine to recognize historical forms. Uh, that was kind of the essential thing. And so it was this marriage of typical uh, digital humanities practices and uh, resources with the, um, the scholarship and, and methods of book history and that combination is um, what I, I hoped to kind of get on the on the trail of in, in this project. So um, I've I've been able to uh, I'll take take some of those um, structural elements to inform my current project. Um, and as a result, I've structured my my methodology upon what I refer to as intrinsic uh, an intrin intrinsic approach rather than uh, the more traditional contextual model. So, um, if you if you read books about illustration practices, historical techniques, um, what the recommendations are is that you might pay attention to the date of the imprint of the book. You might look at the location of textual elements. Uh, whether that's movable type or whether it's script placed in or on to the matrix that uh, produces the print. Uh, the, the presence of plate marks, these things are um, largely external to the image of the print itself. The intrinsic approach is to utilize the characteristics of the marks made upon the matrix, which could be anything from um, a pear wood plank block to a boxwood end grain block it could be a, a copper or a steel plate. Um, it could be a big chunk of, of limestone. And 
to determine the, the tools that were used and um, the, the features uh, strictly based on the, um, the marks that are made. So what advantages might this contextual model provide? Um, at magnification features such as the taper at the end of a line um, or the behavior of ink around the contours can uh, determine a great number of variables and, and provide a lot of significant um, perspective into the book's uses and, and audience. So just to give you a, a better sense of, of how I'm approaching this stemma in, in my work, um, my concept is that the, the, the models flowcharts will allow a reader, whether that's a, a human or a machine, to uh, look closely at the, the marks transferred from the matrix to the substrate and to make a decision about the tools that created them um, and the, the substance into or onto which the tools interacted and, and by that, the, the techniques involved. So this is one piece of the, of the model. Um, it also includes kind of equivalent charts for categories like chromatic prints, linear prints, some combined processes as well as modern process prints. Um, but to, to go into this in a little more detail, uh, this portion of the, the model involves tonal prints, um, which I defined as the deployment of dots of various sizes and shapes to provide the impression of shifting values of light and darkness in the completed image. And so the, this quadrant of the, of the stemma is uh, to show a, the true stipple dots placed individually on the plate block or stone rather than being applied in groups. And uh, so to go a little more closely, um, if the, this true stipple is individual dots appearing on a white background, there are a couple of options. Up above is a, a, an example of a stone lithograph um, in which the, the marks are made on the surface of the stone with a grease pencil or brush and have a, a comparatively soft appearance, a rounded appearance. At the bottom, the lower example is um, marks inscribed or scratched through the surface coating of a copper plate to create a, a stipple intaglio print. And, and this gives a more uh, angular appearance and as you, as you can sort of see by looking at these, if you had these without any other context, it would take a, a fair amount of experience and, and background to be able to distinguish the two. Here's another part of the flow chart, which is a negative stipple, which is um, clearly different. And, and at least at this level of detail, represents a negative stipple cut into an end grain block as a technique of, of wood engraving. So my, my work is, um, the data has been gathered into this type of sheet that um, identifies the, the artist in the specific book and, and the plate and then has the, the, the number of images that are linked to those particular things, um, which has been uh, challenging in these difficult times to, to produce. But just very quickly, um, Here's an example of a, of a wood engraving block. And speaking of the, the matrix or the source of these prints, um, to the left, a block by the 20th century wood engraver, George Mackley, which is held in the Cushing Memorial Library at Texas A&M. And at the right, a 3D scanned and printed block um, from Mattioli's Dioscorides, printed in Prague in 1562, uh, which is at the uh, University of Illinois. And um, one aspect of my research involves the examination and measurement of these historical blocks um, to determine the way in which the, the removal of the material and the marks that were made uh, indicates features that are not visible in the, in the completed print. Um, my, my experiments with uh, printing 3D printed blocks and, and seeing if they can be, can be run on the, on, for example, a, a modern proof press have been, I would say, less, uh, less productive than the ability to um, visualize the, visual, the, the physical object of the block to see those marks that are made and, and wasting or, or carving away the, the negative space. The, the final component of my project um, involves a, sort of a little more investigation of the 
the equipment and objects used to, to produce these books in the period. Um, these are, this is a, a common press and a rolling press that are both housed at the Museum Platten Moretus in Antwerp. Uh, both date from the 17th century. Um, and the, the common press is, is regarded as the earliest working press that's still extant. Um, and the, the scars that are visible in the wooden and even the metal components of these objects um, testify to the, the continuous repetitive action, the motions that were performed in the process of their, of their labor and the creation of the books. And it, it seems to me that these actions um, still present as these negative marks upon the, the tools used to create the illustrations are the lasting mark of the, the physical labor uh, of the of the forgotten laborers, these anonymous um, press workers that, that produce these these works. And so, I, I'm working on um, a, a letterpress printed book that includes a text about this, as well as six of these three block relief illustrations that that utilize the the techniques from the period um, to to create portraits of these objects with all of their imperfections and um, and flaws. And it seems to me that these specific materials, the the machines and the blocks and the other objects, um, which depict the way that they were used and abused, altered and damaged, but but yet retained, um, provide a necessary addition to the, the currently understood narratives of, of book history. Thank you. Thank you so much, Todd, and thank you to all of our presenters. I always love hearing about the projects that are happening and where your research has taken you. Um, we still have about 30 minutes, but I do think we're going to lose one of our presenters early. Malad, you have to leave soon. Do you have time to take one question we had from the chat box? Of course, yes. And then, and then <laughs> I apologize, we we'll have to leave this Zoom room for another. No problem. I was interested in this as well. So from Anna Nietrauer, Malad, do you set a certain key for the sonic visualizations? Set a, uh, sorry, what was the question again? You, oh, well, and Anna, you're probably here as well if you want to unmute, but uh, the question in the chat box was, do you set a certain key for the sonic visualizations? I do, and it usually does not start at the right key, um, but then you have to, uh, uh, find the right place in terms of the, the sonification that you like. One thing that I always refer back to is uh, Charles Dodge's 1970 uh, piece of uh, Earth's magnetic fields, uh, where he actually worked with a KP index of uh, uh, the electromagnetism of Earth and the solar flares are sonified or not. So I feel like that's the space that I usually start in uh, uh, and I have to wrestle the synthesizers to get to that key that I want to show the, show the, the frequency change uh, in the keys that I want to. Okay, thank you. Um, and so Malad, if we lose you, thank you so much for presenting today. And thank you very much. It was an honor, bye-bye. <laughs> bye. We have several other questions in the chat box that I wanna get to before we move into just open questions for anyone who who asked. We have a few comments too, and I, I tend to kind of skip over the comments because I, unless there's a question embedded in it, but um, there's a question here for, for John, or sorry, from John to Max. Uh, Max, what did you use to make these data visualizations? And I saw that you answered it in chat, but I bet other people want to know the answer to that as well. So if Max, you don't mind answering that to everybody. Yeah, I use, um, so for the analysis, I use R and then I use the, uh, there's a package in R called ggplot, <clears throat> which stands for the uh, grammar of graphics. Uh, that's the GG. And, uh, and so basically it's designed around the idea that like you've got a data set and then you can kind of translate the sort of the way you would think about a data set into uh, like some function that produces graphics. And so it's, it's really manipulable. Um, you can kind of do all the things you would do to data set grouping, slicing, doing all kinds of stuff within the functionality of building a, uh, a uh, like some sort of data visualization. And there's a lot of like add-ons and features and customizations you can do. So it's really a uh, really nice uh, thing to have because you can produce a, once you get the sort of code figured out, you can produce a bunch or you can tweak, tweak it really easily. So really highly recommended. Okay, was it pretty easy to learn? Uh, the, over the summer I did uh, 
there, there's a professor of uh, data visualization who published like his course on <clears throat> uh, for free online. And I played around with that and did a few classes of it. And that was really helpful. Um, I think his name is Andrew Heiss, H-I-S-S -S, at uh, like uh, Georgia State or something like that. Um, and so I played around with that and that and and like with a lot of things, just there's there's a ton of resources online and um, and people build a lot of fun add ons like I was trying to play with doing a uh, animating uh, the graphs and there's like a, there's a GG animate that you can add on to actually create turn your graphs into GIFs and stuff like that or GIFs. Um, and so there's uh, some really easy like fun things that you can do once you kind of have it figured out. Nice and and Jeff Turner says he's a good follow on Twitter so. Mm -hmm. announcement. Um, John, I think we have a question for you from Greg Hatch. And it's a little bit of a comment, but I think there's a question in here too. So uh, Greg had said, I wonder if your site could be tied to the find a researcher tool. So there's a faculty.utah.edu backslash find a researcher, perhaps even share database entries since that site also has bios, links to research publications and has keyword search. So John, have you considered um, tying your tool back to other tools for finding people on campus? Uh, we haven't done that at this stage, but that is a really good idea because I think it would help reach a much larger audience and um, get a lot of that like feedback of the resources. Um, I think if it could somehow tie into that database and still stand alone as its own, what the category is that it's, you know, the native scholars thing, but that is a really good um, suggestion that I think would help because we are trying to reach a much larger audience. And John, I had a follow-up question to that as well. Have you considered expanding the database outside of the University of Utah to other researchers maybe in Utah, like at BYU or Weber, Utah State? Uh, that's something I had been considering. I need to discuss it with Greg, because at this point, it's only internal to the U because it's going to, um, we're going through the university websites. So that's why it has that test uh, label on it right now. Um, but I, I think that, because it is serving the Utah community at large, that it would be a good idea if we could somehow incorporate um, affiliated scholars or outside scholars to become a much larger database. That's not just, you know, University of Utah um, faculty. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we also had a question in the chat box for Max uh, from Craig. Max, are you accounting for books without blurbs, i.e. no data for that part of the spreadsheet, but perhaps nonetheless meaningful, a silence that might speak volumes? And again, I saw you answered it in chat, but I thought that was a really good question. So I wanted to- Yeah, it's a really good question. And Craig also, uh, and I exchanged a couple of things privately that were uh, real helpful. Because yeah, like one of the things that he points out too is that you know there may be something about blurbing, which is particularly um, like kind of commercial. So the more commercial sides of poetry may tend to have more blurbs or be, um, more blurb heavy. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. I think in general, my process, um, you know, like I didn't, I didn't discover a ton. And so I'm kind of wondering if maybe we're, we may be on a sort of like part of the cycle where now people are tired of them. And so like, I know like there's some presses like Canarium Press is a good poetry press that doesn't do any blurbs at all. And so there may be some kind of like reaction against some of that process, but um, I don't have a, I haven't like tracked that as like them showing up as like a null back cover blurb kind of thing, but that would be a good thing to do and a good way to like track like whether or not the practice itself is becoming more popular or less popular over time. So it's a, it, it's a good thought. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? These were all just such fantastic presentations. Um, I enjoyed them all. Um, I, I'm curious, Max, um, it looks like you did a lot of the parsing kind of, you know, by hand, you saw the, you kind of identified these keywords and, um, and, and, you know, trace over time, which is fantastic. I'm really curious in terms of your knowledge, um, how well these keywords actually tracked with your affective experience as a reader of the, the poetry books, because these are so driven towards sales or prestige or what have you. So I'm just kind of curious about that angle of it yeah i think it um in general it tracked pretty well sort of i was mentioned i was kind of dancing around this when i was talking about lyric and narrative which granted aren't necessarily affective things but uh like i was saying like it sort of passes the the smell test uh for contemporary poetics and so, so that's really interesting um and, and then in terms of affect like i said like it's interesting to me that like you see like a consistent pattern among negative these negative affect words things like that suggest that isn't it isn't necessarily fluky but that there may be some underlying thing like that so 
as I look to like kind of polish this and think towards publication, like I think I'm going to be looking specifically to sort of answer that kind of concern by by looking at, at really things like that that seem really consistent. Um, so in general, it tracks pretty well. The things that are <clears throat> difficult um, with tracking, with my experience, I mean, one of the my initial like th thoughts behind this research project was looking, thinking for ways to sort of like model the sort of sublime language, the, the language around a negative pleasure that often gets tied to contemporary poetry. And so I'm still thinking through like how exactly I want to do that. But it's like, I think one of our blurbs even says something like the collision of heart and mind. These sort of like the way uh, um, poetry is framed around a collision of two things that don't go together or a collision of negative and positive. And so <clears throat> I'm working through some of that. Uh, and, um, and that's kind of like, Figuring out like if, if it's possible to model some of those things that I'm that I definitely think are trendier um, through this language will, will be the sort of next step and, and potentially pretty difficult, but we're working on it. Very cool. Thanks. Marnie, we had a question for you in the chat box or actually kind of two questions um, from Eric Brinvon, who I think had to leave, but uh, we'll read the question anyway, because it's a great one. So he said, interesting project. How do you guard against endless pro uh, proliferation of terms? That is, makers might continue to make finer and finer distinctions between different variations of their practice, but they might be useful to catalogers under a broader term. Is there a notion of generality versus specificity in the terms that you're collecting? Um, it's a good question. Um, and certainly we are modeling ourselves after catalogers. So we are trying not to parse things any thinner than we need to. Um, but at the same time, the connectivity or the connections that catalogers and curators make are often very different from those that that makers um, make. <laughs> so um, I, I found as a maker, I am really responsive to data as I collect it. And that's really objects um, are, are, or artifacts are really what I respond to with my work. Um, and I think I'm the same as a researcher, <laughs> same way as a researcher. So as data comes in, I think we will probably have conversations, I hope, with people who will provide um, language. And so I'm not super concerned, I guess, is what I'm saying with things getting out of hand. Um, I think the field of, of art of book art is growing, but um, it's it's a, you know, a fairly small community. And um, I've been in conversation with a lot of people in our field for a number of years. So the conversations that I've had thus far towards um, a shared vocab have been very positive um, and have um, I think been helpful in filtering things rather than um, broadening too large. But um, I think catalogers are also more open to that now um, than, than they once were. So, I mean, discoverability is our shared goal. So I hope that helps. I know his second question was about um, viewer, reader, and I actually interchange those words quite commonly, but uh, visual language um, does have uh, translation into uh, verbal uh, descriptions, and that's what this project is about. So I think that reading um, takes on uh, visual aspects as well as verbal. Thank you. And I think that's all the questions we had in the chat box. So now I just open the floor up to questions that any of you have. I have one for Marnie. I was curious uh, if like, uh, I realize, like there's something about, uh, you know, like culture that oftentimes enjoys the process of categorization, especially, you know, you think about like, oh, this metal band, they're not really metal. They're thrash metal, slap, you know, like you can kind of get into, and that's part of the process of enjoying it you know, is, is to understanding and developing a taste for like the subcategories. And so I'm curious about you as like sort of a maker slash uh, archivist um, to like how you think the process of actually going through this different distinguishment, this distinguishing parts or distinguishing categories, like how do you think that factors into your own sort of like enjoyment of it? And also how do you think that part of the, that would uh, kind of play out for someone on the other side, like someone who comes to the website, how does this like play into their enjoyment of this genre? Well, I think that research in the humanities parallels research in the sciences, right? So our ability to gather information and then to um, codify it is really key to our 
understanding and to finding meaning. Um, and I think it's important um, as makers to recognize what's out there, you know, and and how our work and our thoughts and, and what we're making and doing relates to um, the larger scope of what has been done historically and what's happening um, right now in the art world um, or more specifically the book art world. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, um, but um, yeah. Anyone else? I had a question for Marnie as well. How do you distinguish between, what is the criteria for distinguish an artist book and a <laughs> non-book artifact? Well, I don't. <laughs> I mean, honestly, my umbrella is really large. I think that um, all of it can be um, included. Um, it's... I don't think, you know, it's similar to, I'm not super interested in the divisions between poetry and prose, for instance. Um, I think that's fairly antiquated. I hope I'm not upsetting anyone by saying that, but um, I think that books that need to be published in the now um, are often artist books. Um, and um, outside of, you know, pure research utilitarian books, so. That's my personal opinion. Um, but to, to clarify, they do need to have a visual and material presence to be um, included. But you know that could take on a more performative role, or it could be um, a digital a digital book in a digital space. I had another question. If I could monopolize this time a little bit, uh, Todd, with your project. Um, I, I love how you're trying to reinscribe the materiality of the printing process with regards to images and books. Do, is your larger goal, do you have a larger goal of um, using that sort of flow chart or that categor, cat, uh, categorization method that you've generated and using that process to create data that would eventually be incorporated into a book's metadata, for example? I think so. You know, the the for me the the heavy lifting of this project um, was was partially just trying to figure out a, a kind of binary structure for for going through these various techniques and historical practices and figuring out relationships and and those sorts of things and then um, finding examples that are linked to those particular processes. Um, and so I, I'm very interested in um, having some kind of production that, that may come out of this that, you know, uh, to, to step back, um, some of you may know Terry Bellinger, who was a, he's a book historian. He founded Rare Book School, um, originally in New York. It's now in, in uh, Virginia, the University of Virginia. And, He's taught uh, a course on historical printmaking identification 45, over 45 times. And over the course of his career, he's also a MacArthur Genius Award winner. And over the course of his career, he's put together um, a, a body of examples of these various uh, prints um, to put into the hands of people to scrutinize, to, to look at under magnification. And um, his, his statement, um, about the sort of efficacy of this training is that um, is identifying prints in my experience is a history of failure and you're, you're going to be thwarted as often as you're going to get things right. Um, and so it seems to me that um, finding some kind of process that is um, um, objective-ish um, that provides you with a sort of a degree of, of confidence could be incorporated into um, catalog records and other other descriptions that would provide researchers with access. Um, right now, I, I think that part of what motivated Marnie in her project is that people come to our reading room and say, can I see an example of a tunnel book? And sometimes that information can be found in our, our catalog records, but more often I think our, our curators knowing the collection 
are needed to kind of make that that contact. And so to have something um, like that for the rare books collection, for our older material, for um, printed ephemera, uh, for maps, um, could be could be pretty key. Thanks, Todd. I have a question as I as I hear several of these presentations, but in particular, I'm thinking about uh, John and Marnie. You know, we we have a four year theme in the digital matters uh, space of sustainability, and how do these projects continue to live on past the interest of the individual researcher. So Marnie, with your thesaurus, for example, if you were to make this robust thesaurus, is there like a sustainability plan of either like a, like an, a book artist's professional organization that might take ownership of that? Maybe like the Getty takes ownership of the art and architecture thesaurus and preserves it and keeps it moving forward? Or John, you know, is it the American West Center that will take on this uh, website when you're done with it? I, do you want me to go first, John? Yeah, I mean, really anyone. <laughs> okay. Can. So um, the question about where it where it lives was a big question that led me to want to to do this project here and now. Um, so it's housed at the library, um, and the library's book arts program is fairly well established, um, and just from um, the level of work that has gone into this type of research for the past, um, you know. 15 years, but really more like 30. Um, I, I don't have concerns about it living on. Um, I think that um, it will be sustainable. And as far as my limited interest, I don't think that pertains quite frankly, because um, I, I started as a staff um, with the library, um, part-time actually, um, and then have been in a full-time position for 20 years, but a faculty for only 10. And um, as an administrator, I find very little time to do research. So this project has really kind of allowed me to springboard into action. And I don't intend for that momentum to slow. So more to come. Um, yeah, and for the clearinghouse, I think for one, it's a um, University of Utah website, so it's got that dot utah.edu. So um, as long as the university is still running, that will exist. I think in terms of keeping it alive and updating it, um, it would just need some sort of middleman to facilitate that. I think the American West Center would probably have a pretty vested interest if there's a future graduate um, fellowship for it or maybe the assistant director will kind of facilitate keeping it up to date. So I think it's pretty set in sustainability because it has the university back in it. Um, it'll just need someone to kind of keep it alive as well. Yeah, with yours, I would see not so much the challenge of like the website going down. It's making sure people are aware and know about it to keep putting their their name, their names on it and adding Yeah, it. I think that's a big challenge. And I think um, kind of spurring new scholars to actually because it's a give and take because they have to volunteer the information and fill out a, a bio. Um, it kind of takes a little bit of prodding. So I think as it hopefully as it gains momentum, more people will be willing to um, send in that information. Thanks. Do we have any more questions for any of our presenters? Except Malad, and if you have a question for him, feel free to email it to us or directly to Malad if you have that question. Okay, well, if that's it for today, thank you so much for attending. Thank you to our presenters for all your great presentations. To everyone, I just hope you have a successful rest of the semester and a really wonderful break. And if we don't see you again, we will see you next semester. Thanks, everyone.